Welcome to Education Matters, presented by the Public School Forum of North Carolina. I'm your host, Tom Williams. Governor Cooper announced last Friday that our school buildings will remain closed for the remainder of this academic year. And this week, our General Assembly members returned to Raleigh to consider coronavirus-related legislation, including a number of policies that will impact our public schools. As we navigate this challenging time as a state, our public schools will continue working to serve our students and families, and learning will continue to happen remotely. Today, we're fortunate to have parents and a community leader from around the state on the show to share their experiences and perspectives on school during coronavirus. We're delighted to have Ms. Yvonne Seaman with us this morning from Oxford, and thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. So how does this remote learning work at your house, and is there a daily schedule, or does it vary, and how are you dealing with it? So with remote learning, it, it does kind of get challenging because I do have more than one child, but we make it work. Um, as far as scheduling, you have to have some type of scheduling with Zoom meetings and, and just getting the kids together and getting them ready and making sure everything gets done. Now, at, at some days, the schedule goes out the window and you kind of just have to you know, adjust accordingly. But most days, as long as you can get a good schedule and, and get, get going, then, then you can make it. And, and of course, the teachers are great as far as providing additional information, reminding you of meetings. And that's one of the most important part is that we do have the community support. That is great. Well, tell us, how is the Oxford Housing Authority supporting your child and you during this time? So the Oxford Housing Authority has always supported us um, from reading programs to taking the kids to um, baseball games and football games and plays. The, they've always been great. During this time, they're providing um, helping um, partnering with the school system and we're, they're bringing meals right here to the parking lot. So that's one great thing that they're doing is bringing them that here. Also, any resources, they, they give away books and right. anything that anybody or any child may need, all you have to do is pick up the phone and contact them. If they don't have it, they'll be glad to link you to anything that you might need. That's great. Well, thank you again so much for being with us today, and I appreciate what you're doing at home with our children. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, we're delighted to have joining us right now Miss Janelle Brizendine. Uh, from Oxford, North Carolina as well. And thank you and welcome to Education Matters. Thank you for having me. So if you will, uh, we recognize that the parent and teacher relationships are even more important with the remote learning that our students are in. Talk to us a little bit from your view of what you think the parent's role is in making that work. I believe that the parent's role is um, to stay in good communication with the teachers. Um, so, so far they've had us with group emails, um, group texting. And so you can contact the teacher anytime you need to, if you have a question or anything. We also have the Zoom learning that we do. So um, that's been very helpful. And we also can FaceTime teachers with information and we do videos online with different programs such as class tag. So that's been very helpful. Excellent. What are your teachers and schools doing that you find is most helpful to you as a parent beyond the, the really good communications, other things that they're doing? Well, I believe they're um, just extending a helping hand. Um, I've had teachers call and just to check in and see how we were doing for the day. Um, if it was anything we needed. Um, my, one of my son's guidance counselors called just to check in and kind of see you know, we had internet and, you know, we were receiving the lunches and if we needed anything. So that was very helpful. Well, that's, that's great. Well, listen, thank you so much for joining us today and offer your insights. As we move forward with remote learning, I think we're going to want to come back and check in with both you and Ms. Siemens and Mr. Wortham again, okay? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a good day. All right, you too. Well, we're delighted to have joining us now from the Oxford Housing Authority, its Executive Director, Xavier Wortham. Mr. Wortham, it's a pleasure to see you. It's great to see you also. The Oxford Housing Authority and the Granville County Public Schools have a strong, long-standing relationship. What do you see as the key to keeping that strong relationship in such challenging times as COVID-19? 
I think one thing that's critical is that the school system and the housing authority and the great community just maintains a focus on uh, our children, uh, focus on parents and the family and the community, uh, assessing uh, and reassessing on a regular basis um, what the needs may be. Um, it's so important that we uh, focus and make sure we don't leave uh, no child behind. That, that's just critical. That, um, uh, and that's just part of the assessing and reassessing, but on a daily basis, because it changes um, from, you know, from household to household. And um, that's one way I think that, uh, that, the, that the school system and the housing authority uh, and the community can work together. Great. Wearing your larger community hat, because um, we know how active you are throughout Granville County and there in the Oxford community. What are, would you say are two or three of the things that are most help to our students and parents? And what do you see and here are some of the biggest challenges, not only for students and parents, but also with teachers between now and when school can reopen, hopefully in the fall? I think connectivity is a um, huge issue uh, throughout our county um, to make sure that we know who has internet and who needs it, and then make sure that the families who, who have internet um, have a tool for which to, uh, gain, um, to get online so the children can do their work, so parents can communicate with their, um, uh, the teachers and the counselors, and also a, a way to make sure that um, there's a scheduled time uh, where it may be a parent meeting, um, and there may be a scheduled time for the, for the students to do a, a particular assignment. Um, so I think hopefully as we move forward, we can, we can have a set time the same way that um, there's a set time for uh, a television shows and other things that, that everybody know at this time, uh, third graders can log in and do a blank assignment. Um, but I think that that's, that's critical that we just know who uh, has internet and who needs it and make sure that, that we as a community um, uh, address that need. Across this state, and I'm assuming in Granville County as well, food insecurity issues. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, students whose households don't have access to the internet. I know that the school systems are trying to provide learning packets that are printed. Have you seen how the food insecurity issues are being addressed as well as maybe getting learning packets to students who don't have internet access? Absolutely. Uh, Granville County Schools has done an outstanding job and showing the community that they care with the, um, with the packets, with uh, Chromebooks, and also with uh, food. Um, the school system itself has done a tremendous job in, in providing food uh, to the students and also doing spring break, a, a new effort this, this year. The school system and the community came together and raised the money to make sure that families got um, food throughout spring break. Uh, during a time that, that children would have ordinarily been without food from school. And so that, that has been addressed really every day uh, since uh, the pandemic hit. Um, we, we made sure that the children in Grammar County have had access to, to food uh, Monday through Friday. Well, that's great. Um, before we close out, I just want to say the Public School Forum and Education Matters is grateful to to you and um, your parents they're joining us today and we're going to look forward to coming back as we get into a re-entry plan and find out how the Oxford Housing Authority and the Granville County Public Schools are planning to address the re-entry plans for our students and parents. It's fantastic. Thank you all so much for all that you do for Granville County and the entire state of North Carolina. We really appreciate it. Thank you Mr. Wortham. We'll be in touch. Yes sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll be right back. Education Matters is brought to you each week in part by Town Bank, serving others, enriching lives. Joining us now is a parent and PTO president of Granville Academy, Jessica Wilkins. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Thank you. It's good to see you. You as well. 
Granville Academy is a Granville County Public School Choice Program using a personalized learning model. And we know that your daughter is going to school there. She's now a first grader and has been there since kindergarten where she's in home at school for three days and then two days at her base zone school. What's your role as a Granville Academy parent in this model during the regular year? I look at it as I'm there to support what she learns her two days a week with her teacher. Even though she's at home with me more than she is at school, I'm still the supporting role, even though I have the more time. Um, we try to really focus, our teachers work very hard those two days a week to get in those, those essential skills to those kids. And we try to support that at home with doing the work that they send home in weekly plans every week. How has it changed now that her two days at her school are now being done remotely as well? It, it is different because again, I'm no longer being the supporting role. I've taken a more active role in the new concepts that are coming from her teacher. However, again, we have amazing teachers and they are right back with us. When, if we have a question or we need something, they're willing to FaceTime or they email or, or anything. But now instead of her learning at school and then me supporting it, we're approaching those new concepts at home. Um, she does miss school. She doesn't miss her schoolwork. She will tell you that as a first grader, but she misses her teachers. She misses her art teacher. She misses going to art and she misses her friends. Right. But she, she is still, she's going along it, learning just like a first grader should. I understand you're the president of the Granville Academy PTO. As you talk to other parents, what are you hearing them saying is going well and any kinds of challenges or barriers they are facing now with this change? Uh, with Granville Academy, we were kind of in a better position to do remote learning because we were already doing it. So as far as the parent side, ours hasn't changed a whole lot other than we're now introducing new concepts to our kids. Um, again, they're missing their friends, missing their specials, but I have contacts at other schools that are now full-time doing it where they were at school every day. And they're, they're trying to figure out that piece of being mommy and teacher. Well, we are really... Uh, grateful to you for joining us. Thank you for the work you're doing as a president of the PTO there at Granville Academy and good luck as uh, remote learning continues, okay? Thank you, Dr. Williams. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Joining us now from Moore County is parent Allison McCloskey. We are so delighted to have you here today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. What I'd like you to do is maybe share with us what uh, you've learned and what kind of adjustments uh, as a parent you've made over the last three or four weeks with remote learning? Well, I have an only child. And so when all of this happened, it hit him really hard. Uh, he misses his friends. He misses his teachers. He misses just the daily school activities. And he was invested in a lot of after school activities. So he was used to being very busy. So in the beginning, you know, I didn't push school as much. We had our list of assignments and we did them the best that he could. But I needed to make sure his emotional well-being was set before we really dug in. And it takes a while because he's used to being with everybody and all of a sudden he's at home and doesn't really leave. Um, we've got into a, you know, a steady good routine now. And um, he understands that this is just how we have to do school at the moment. But um, he still worries about next year, getting into the right classes, making sure his grades stay up. Um, so it's been a big adjustment. As for me, um, I'm attempting to balance Ryland's schoolwork. Um, I'm taking college courses, so I still have my own schoolwork to do. And I'm a preschool teacher. So that stopped when Moore County Schools stopped. So I'm still trying to connect with all of my students as well. What are some changes you've seen our teachers make and how you feel it's working for them and anything that you think the state could do to offer them better support? Okay, so Governor Cooper made a really good decision on March 14th to close all of the schools. And, but it only left our teachers like two days to come up with a plan of how are we going to get all of our classrooms situated to be online. And within two days of the governor's announcement, our teachers have already emailed us, had given us activities, had checked in to make sure we had what we needed. Um, my particular, um, my son works with Google Classroom. So all of his teachers are on one site, which really helps. So I can see his 
his AIG teacher, his science and math, his English, you know, English and his, all of the specials, they're all on one page. So we just go on there and we can um, look to see what he needs to do and we could submit. Um, the teachers have been amazing uh, with communication and double checking to see if, you know, can you, can you get on this website? Does this work? And they've been very good at understanding that um, each student is different and is in a different home situation. Ryland's right. lucky enough that I can stay at home Right. But there are other kids who don't have, you know, access to the internet or both of their parents work. And right. so they've been really good with um, understanding and kind of helping mold the learning to each individual student. Um, as for the state, I think the state really just needs to trust in what our teachers are doing. Um, the teachers are the experts here. They know their students. They know their classrooms. They know where they are, as in teaching wise. And this is new. Nothing has happened like this before. Right. So everybody's kind of, you know, winging it, I guess is the right term. Right. And if the state just trusts that the teachers are doing what they need to do and the best job they can, right. then, you know, just, just let them do it. However that looks. That's Ms. McCloskey, it's been so great having you on the show today. We're going to look forward to following up with you as we move throughout the rest of the year and look forward to getting an update from you. We're delighted to have Ben Willis with us. And uh, Ben is the director of the Caldwell Education Foundation uh, in Caldwell County in Lenore. Tell us what's going on and where are you? Hey, Tom. Well, thanks for, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm actually in a parking lot in my car at the Martin Luther King Center. And we're actually uh, connected uh, to a school bus uh, that has Wi-Fi on it to be able to kind of uh, communicate and tell you about some of the cool things that we've got Wait. going on over here. If I understand, this is one of 31 rolling study halls there in Caldwell County. So let's go. All right. Well, cool. I'm going to show you what it's like. Yeah. Okay. So, so basically, um, uh, the Caldwell County school system had a, a, a handful of these guys uh, a couple years ago. And... Um, thanks to our corporate partners uh, uh, with Google, we were able to upfit these things because of COVID-19, and we've placed these things out throughout the community. And as you can see, uh, there's that little white gadget guy up right up there. Yeah, and so um, that basically blasts the signal out to the parking lots uh, of different uh, different locations. We've got them at schools, we've got them at uh, churches. This is a, a community center here in one of our lower income areas. Uh, we're trying to strategically place these things where people can really take advantage of it who may not have access. I know that with uh, limited access, parent engagement's really critical and student support. How's this helping? Well, this, again, uh, I think it really highlights the fact that there are, there's a lot of people that, that don't have access. They can't afford it or they're just in, in places in the rural parts of the, of the state like we have in some of the outskirts of our community. Uh, it's just it's just hard to get access, and so this helps provide access for people who who may need it to help uh, connect them with um, um, to their schoolwork. Uh, parents can also get on here. It's, this is for the community. So if parents need to be able to find resources for themselves, maybe possible job, uh, we're partnered with the community college. Community college is blasting it out to their students as well, so they can take advantage of these uh, of these spots. It's really for the the, the entire community and and hopefully they'll take advantage of it. It sounds like you're also plugged into electricity. So typically these systems are, are turned on when the uh, buses are turned on, but now these guys are, we have a, put adapters on here, so these things are connected um, to uh, a, a 110 outlet, so these right. buses don't have to be running. So that's a, that's a cool thing to be able to do, and that's part of the upfit. Um, we definitely want to come back and do a more detailed tour and talk to some of your parents and students and teachers and uh, your superintendent, too. Well, we would love to have you, Tom. We really appreciate it. And if there's any other school system out there that needs help or assistance on trying to get these things implemented, please uh, feel free to reach out to the Education Foundation of Caldwell County. We'd, we'd be happy to help and show people how to do this. Great. As they say on the news, coming to us live from Lenore, it's Ben Wilson, Willis, the director of the Caldwell Ed Foundation at a rolling study hall. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. We'll be right back after this break.
If you are the parent or legal guardian of one of North Carolina's 1.5 million children who attended school on Friday, March 13th, it was just another normal day. You got the kids up, got them ready for school, took them to the bus stop or to the drop-off lane, and got yourself ready for the day either at work or at home, and the weekend was just around the corner. Well, that took a dramatic change when the impending consequences of COVID-19 and its impact on our day-to-day -day lives in North Carolina and the U.S. was altered in a manner we'd never seen as a state or nation. Governor Cooper announced that it was necessary to close our schools effective Monday, March 16th through Sunday, May 15th to help minimize the spread of this pandemic virus while the state continued to implement its full response to the coronavirus. Based on the evolution of the related public health issues and the governor's stay-at-home executive order, the most recent decision necessitating the closure of our schools beyond May 15th and through the remainder of the year came as no surprise. Across the U.S., 42 other states have already reached the same decision. Over the past seven weeks, our students, teachers, and yes, our parents have begun making the shift to a new reality of remote learning. In school buildings where 100% of our traditional public schools have robust access to high-speed broadband internet access and needed devices, the use of online resources and technology is available. But as Education Matters has highlighted in previous weeks, for many of our students and teachers, once they return home, this connectivity and the availability of devices is dictated by the resources in the student's community and household. The necessary shift to remote learning has taken an already critical factor in student success, parent engagement, and for many has truly turned it upside down and even inside out for some. Parent-teacher-school relationships and communication has always been a key to student success. Today, it's even more fundamental. Just as each of our children are uniquely different, our parents and guardians and their circumstances as related to remote learning are unique as well. Just imagine the diversity across the state and each family when it comes to the family structure, number and ages of school-aged children, availability of the internet, cell phones, technology, employment needs, learning needs, food insecurity, and childcare. The range of these needs are front and center as our teachers and counselors, school social workers and nurses, as well as principals and superintendents seek to support parents in the essential role they now fill in remote learning. Research on parent engagement that makes the most impact on student learning centers around three factors. First, setting high expectation for their child to apply themselves and actively engage in their own learning. Second, being aware of what their child is learning and talking about what they are learning. Yes, parents, check their work. And finally, staying connected to your child's teacher and work to build a positive relationship that is centered on the child's needs. Our teachers experience firsthand the unique needs and barriers their students' parents face in the remote learning environment. As a state and in every local community, let's find as many ways as possible to address the inequities and other barriers to support our parent-teacher relationships in this challenging time and keep the student needs at the center of our efforts. A special thanks goes out to all of our parents for working every day to strengthen the student-home-school connection. Our kids are counting on all of us. That's it for this week's show. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week.